for those of you filtering in, we're just going to wait a, a minute or two uh, to get more people in the room. White Earth Anishinaabe Nation, Minnesota. Welcome you all tonight again to another night of unsettling genealogies. Um, we, if you've looked at the program of late, you'll see that we'll have some changes tonight. Um, unfortunately, uh, a few of our speakers that we had scheduled for weeks uh, at the last minute and said they could not make it. We are tra trying to reschedule them for a, an, an additional panel that we haven't yet put together for, for mid-April. Uh, we're, we're working on that. So um, we do have a, a great lineup tonight, though. I'm, I'm sure you'll be uh, impressed and informed by the end of this session tonight. Um, I want to remind you again that this is not a a form for uh, you to try to figure out who your ancestors are. That is to ask to ask questions of the panelists about your genealogy. That's that's up to you to figure out. I mean, um, there are ways you can find that out uh, on your own. So please refrain from those kinds of questions. Uh, we're dealing with a pretty uh, pretty important political issues and and social issues and what I would call social justice issues in this conference. Um, our first speaker tonight will be. Brian Haley, he's from the State University of New York in Oneonta. Uh, and then we'll turn to uh, Sandy, I'm probably not gonna get your last name right. Sandy uh, Wemigwase the, of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa Indians. And then Shax Watso will be our third speaker. Um, they will provide their own introduction for the most part. Um, and please, again, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat and uh, we'll share them with the speakers tonight. Thanks again for joining us. I'll turn it over now to Brian Haley. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be participating in this conference. This is something I've looked forward to for, uh, or seen a, a need for, for, for four decades now. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that story but first, I just want to um, say my circumstances here are a little unique. I'm, I'm a non-native person. Uh, I am coming to you live from a cancer ward in uh, Rochester University's Medical Center on the land of the Haudenosaunee, and I am receiving cancer treatments, which has got me at a little bit of uh, uh, a loss at times. Um, so I'll do my best, but I am not at my best. Um, so what I, what I want to share with you is uh, kind of a, a personal history of involvement in the issues that, we're, that the conference is addressing and, and maybe speak a little bit about the, uh, the, the ongoing work that I've uh, been continuing on this topic, which um, is building very close to publication at this point. So um, I first became aware of, well, pretendians, neo-Indians. I mostly use the term neo-Indian for, for ethical reasons in anthropology. I first became aware of their existence in 1979 as a senior undergraduate at the University of California, Santa Barbara when I needed to take a, a term off and earn some money um, at, in cultural resource management. And the, uh, the archeologists there who were training me were very forward thinking at their time and looked to work with native peoples and um, collaborate with native peoples and work those interests into their, their work. Um, at that point in time, a number of 
neo-Indians had recently emerged in the Santa Barbara area and achieved a, a singular success of getting um, positive reinforcement and recognition from uh, local governments and um, even a little bit from the state. There's no state recognition in California. Um, so working with them, uh, my, my interactions with them began in 70, 79. I thought at the beginning there was something kind of unusual there. There is uh, a federally recognized Santa Inez Band of Mission Indians, which is Chumash in the same area and working with them at the same time, I heard their whispers about these other folks who I have come to call Neo Chumash. Uh, by 1982, um, in the through the continued efforts of Neo Chumash to prove up their, um, their claims of ancestry, uh, the opposite was achieved, and uh, uh, a colleague of mine had uh, discovered that their ancestry lay in the Spanish colonial population uh, of California and did not include native Californians at all. So from that point forward, I then knew uh, without question really that I was working with Neo Chumash, but um, because of the politics of, uh, uh, of the situation, um, there was nothing to be done about it. Um, the local governments had decided these were people who got to do the work in cultural resource management of protecting uh, Native American sites, the Chumash uh, area sites, of making decisions about human remains that would be found uh, and so on. So it was a mess and it sidelined the interests and concerns of uh, actual Chumash, which included not just the San Inez band, but descendants of the mission communities of Santa Barbara, Ventura, San Luis Obispo uh, as well, all of whom I knew members from all of them. And they complained over and over and over again um, but because the information about Neo Chumash had emerged under um, confidential circumstances, nothing could be done. Uh, as scholars, we couldn't make reveals at that point. Um, later on, uh, now I went on and did other work that was unrelated to cultural resource management, but was related to issues of identity and was related to um, populations with origins in Mexico. Um, and then I came back and uh, did more work in this area in Santa Barbara and was asked to do a project um, on a place that had been the center of activism for uh, the Neo Chumash um, right before I met them in 1979, Point Conception, California. And in doing a study, uh, a, a couple of studies of that, we discovered that some of our colleagues had fabricated ethno-historical data, which made it appear that the uh, rituals carried on by Neo Chumash had been uh, handed down from uh, uh, Chumash ancestors in the early 20th century. They fabricated, they made an addition of text to uh, an actual um, ethno-historical source. And my colleague and I realized at the time that, uh, that this was very important, that it had assisted Neo Chumash in achieving the political support uh, that they had acquired there in the Santa Barbara region. And uh, we realized that ethically we were obligated to report this. So we knocked around how to do that. We eventually, we gave some papers and so on and earned lots of 
um, criticism from, from peers. Um, but we eventually published this in Current Anthropology, which is a major international journal. And, um, you know, there were other angles to it. Um, it was a complicated piece, but we pointed out point blank that uh, these, these people identifying as the, the most traditional Chumash lacked both the ancestry and affiliation that they claimed. Um, that earned some really hard blowback from uh, colleagues who had built their careers as um, forward-thinking collaborative anthropologists working with native peoples, but had been really working with Neo Chumash all along. So their reputations were at stake. And we had kind of put this on the line. Um, so we were attacked in yet a second round of essays in current anthropology and um, defended ourselves as best we could. I returned to that uh, work again and, and to answer those critics, published a Neo Chumash history, which demonstrated unequivocally that their roots lay in the Spanish colonizing expeditions uh, from 1769 to, into about 1819. And uh, the reaction to that was rather interesting. And it was so overwhelmed, so overwhelmed our critics with evidence that they, they, they couldn't respond. So they pretend, they pretend it doesn't exist. In between all of this, uh, we experienced efforts to um, block our ability to publish in professional journals um, with fabricated stories of all sorts and so on. But we kept publishing and it has had some effect on the local um, cultural resource management. Um, I don't remember which jurisdiction it is, but there were some that uh, removed the Neo Chumash from their approved list of monitors. Um, others did not. So that um, did have some effect. Um, around 2010, I picked this research up again after finishing some work on Mexican immigration. And I um, um, expanded it quite a bit. I, I basically, the project is called uh, Unexpected Histories. And basically what I do is I, I, I pose a, a, a question, who, who and what inspired these people to reinvent themselves as Chumash and as traditionalists? And I followed leads, found that source, posed the question again, who, who or what inspired them and followed this back in time. And a starting point, bizarrely enough, is when a Christian anarchist by the name of Ammon Hennessy um, in, in, in the days after World War II, makes a connection with Third Mesa Hopis who opposed the tribal council and were beginning to organize a movement of sorts. And Ammon Hennessy became their outside connection. They didn't have enough support on the res, so they decided to reach out um, for support from outside to try and get their um, achieve their political goals. That mushroom, by the 1950s, uh, the early 50s, uh, uh, an organization known as the League of North American Indians um, was involved with the Hopi traditionalists and promoting them as um, the source of a kind of universal uh, uh, prophecy um, they were mixing in a great deal of Western metaphysics into this. And as it turns out, the leadership of the League of North American Indians was comprised almost entirely of kind of an original first generation of Neo-Indians. Um, the author, uh, uh, Frank Waters, whose book, uh, Book of the Hopi, became a, a touchstone for the 60s hippies, uh, was also lured in as a part of all of this. 
he too is a neo-Indian. Uh, my project traces uh, much of the development of these various neo-Indians by doing a lot of biography and tracing this over time to show that we're not dealing with isolated individuals acting on their own. We're looking at something with roots mid-century, which is the development of what the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu would call a social field, the creation of a neo-Indian social field of articulated roles, shared meanings, and, and symbols, and so on. And from the 1940s through the 19, early 1960s, this field is constructed, um, and I've documented how it is built um, with these various participants. And then at the end of this, in the late 60s, through a connection to uh, a radio show in Los Angeles called Radio Free Oz, can't make this stuff up. Um, it explodes into the hippie counterculture and communes are formed and the Neo-Chumash, first generation of Neo-Chumash emerge from that. Radio Free Oz, for those of you who haven't heard of that, um, perhaps you've heard of the Fire Sign Theater. That's who those guys became, recording artists. They're in the uh, Library of Congress now. Um, one other thing I really want to stress here is that as a social field, the various, there are different roles. And one of the things that I've been um, working on uh, lately is the role of, of academics. The, 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 the penetration of this into the academy is, of course, of, of great concern to all of us and um, uh, really is kind of this huge recent manifestation. I'm ad addressing a phenomenon I call cahooting. The actions or processes associated with conducting a partnership built on deception. The deception may be intentional or a product of naivete. Partners in cahoots may all be deceitful, all naive, or a mix of the two. And I get this, uh, this concept, uh, I adapted this from a book by Edward Dolnick, The Forger's Spell, um, which explores the reasons uh, behind the great success of the Vermeer forger, uh, Henricus Antonius uh, Han van Meegeren, who famously sold a fake to Hermann Goering during World War II. Um, in, in, it's not just Dolnick's uh, forger's spell, but also um, anthropologists and sociologists who have studied the art, the, 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 the art field. Um, Bourdieu himself studied this as well. Um, forgers, dealers, collectors of art, um, are in cahoots because they all need the forgery to be perceived as real, even though their reasons differ. Um, uh, an analogy is the, 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 uh, the, the Hopi uh, Kachina doll carver today needs the museums, needs the publications, needs the art critics, um, the anthropologists, and so on that help develop the market and, and talk about things like authenticity and variations of form and so on. They all need one another. Um, so, what happens in these instances and then uh, we've been looking at how um, neo-Indians are uh, entering into academia and succeeding in academia. Um, academia needs them for its um, diversity, equity, and inclusion numbers. Um, 
you're all familiar with assessment. Uh, and, you know, uh, the counting that goes on as a result of the box checking of forms where people are asked to state their identity or race um, is uh, a measurement, very poor one, of course, uh, that uh, the institution uses to um, prove its success at, at diversity, equity, and inclusion. But scholars also who do not themselves uh, make any claim to uh, Native American identities are themselves key promoters of uh, and essential to the success of Neo-Indians in academia. And, you know, as, uh, one of the things that um, Dolnik uh, very accurately says is the greatest asset a forger can have is an expert who believes in them. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the case. I have made complaints about various people in various institutions, uh, including uh, clear cut cases of pretendianism. And uh, the response was, well, we have this expert here on our faculty. They're an expert on, on, on Chumash, on the Chumash people. And so they know and they can tell us, well, you, you must, this is a wonderful sort of slate of hand argument that occurs uh, that is the kind of thing that we see sort of regularly in, in, in this, this relationship that is necessary to the success of the Neo-Indian. The slate of hand is, well, here's someone who's, whose history is not actually in the Chumash, but the identity is being interpreted as a direct reflection of their history. So a Chumash expert is a perfect person to vouch for them, right? And, and that seems to convince colleagues, deans, students, the public to a certain degree, but I've recently been finding that the press has raised, has been a little more skeptical. And, and so that's kind of interesting. Um, one of the many things I've been trying to do with this research is just get out what is different about neo-Indianism from an anthropological perspective. Um, because, you know, in anthropology and sociology, people changing identities, race, ethnic, whatever, is not unusual. Identity change is not unique. If we could dig deep enough in everybody's history, we'd find it. It's the appropriation of identity here that is unique and unanticipated. Um, there are tons of studies that show identity change, but it's nearly always when, uh, some, when an outsider is welcomed into and incorporated into a group that is already existing, right? And this is clearly something different. The outsiders may try to get in and are rejected, so maybe they form their own, or they don't even bother with trying to get in, they form their own, right? Um, so this is the unique aspect of neo-Indianism that was really not anticipated um, by scholars. When we started uh, doing our work on this, um, and, and the first person, the, the first of my colleagues to, to publish on this published in 1988, there was no other research available um, on this to speak of. I think there was a single study by a folklorist um, on the Ramapo mountain people. And that was it. Uh, there was like, oh yeah, there, there's people who claim to be Cherokee. And that was about the sum total of what that was too. Um, so we've had to kind of um, figure this out as we went along. Um, you know, my first publications on this were in 97 and 98. And, uh, and then 2005, 
we added a major American anthropolo anthropologist article um, documenting Neo Chumash um, roots in the Spanish colonization of California. We also showed in that case, their history was full of identity changes preceding becoming Chumash. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it quits there. I'm kind of talked out right now and I'll listen in and if I can answer questions later, I will do so. Um, but I think that's probably enough to get people's heads spinning. All right. All right, miigwech, Brian, appreciate it. Thank you. There are questions already popping up in chat, so we'll, we'll get to them and also in the Q&A. So I'm going to turn it over to Sandy now. Sandy's a member of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa Indians. She's a pre-doctoral fellow in American Indian and Indigenous Studies at Michigan State University. I can't even say Indigenous anymore. Uh, as well as a doctoral candidate at the University of Toronto in social justice education. Her research seeks to explore Indigenous-led ways to identify Indigenous students during the admissions process in higher education. So welcome, Sandy. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation and to be here in this um, space, I guess this virtual space, like it's always good connecting. Um, like uh, Gordon said, I am Sandy Womagwas. Uh, I'm Ozawa Kishigokwe Indigenakaz, Badaskin Donjba, Ajiak Dodem, Wagnaxin Odawakwe Da. Um, so let me share my screen with you. I pretend that I'm a professional at this. That is not where I wanted to go. Switching it. There, I'm a professional. Okay, got it. Nailed it. It's perfect. So, um, like I said, my name is Sandy Womagwas. Um, I'm a member of Little Traverse Bay Bands. Of Odawa Indians located up in Petoskey, Michigan. Um, I'm living in Lansing right now, writing my dissertation as the 2021-22 pre-doc fellow in American Indian and Indigenous Studies here at Michigan State. Um, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Toronto in social justice education. So one of the questions that I want to answer is like, why this research? Um, as Gordon talked about that, um, my research is focusing on how to identify indigenous students on admissions forms so that there are less fraudulent claims of self-indigenization. So imagine a world when indigenous students fill university campuses, when non-indigenous students don't pretend to have spirit animals, a futurity in which higher education is a place deserving of Indigenous students because the needs of Indigenous students are met. As an Indigenous students provider, imagine sending a survey asking Indigenous students which services they need and only having Indigenous students respond. And finally, imagine a listserv of Indigenous students where it's only Indigenous students on this listserv and not those who want to be Indigenous. In this imaginary world, scholarships and funding available to Indigenous students are awarded to Indigenous students and not those who are not Indigenous or who had a great, 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 great grandmother who maybe was an Indian. I want Indigenous students to see university as a place they can exist because they will not lose themselves or their indigeneity trying to navigate the institutional system on their own. I want universities to feel like an extension of an Indigenous home. My idea of home is a place where people care for you, where people love you, and where people support your dreams. I know universities like this can exist. I know programs like this exist across Turtle Island, but I want them to be the standard and not the few and even farther between. 
I want a place where the responsibilities of the Indigenous Student Organization President, the powwow chair, and the representative in student government can be three different Indigenous students and not one student expect, expected to be all things because there are no other Indigenous students to share the responsibilities. I want Indigenous students to be able to concentrate on their education by having a university that is worthy of their time and efforts. I'm done with non-Indigenous students taking up space intended for Indigenous students. I'm tired of white supremacy allowing this to happen. I'm tired of non-Indigenous students choosing to become Indigenous when it's convenient for them. When non-Indigenous people choose who is Indigenous and who is not, they commit Indigenous erasure. I'm tired of institutions acting like they have nothing to do with this when they continuously allow this ethnic fraud as, divine, as defined by Angela Gonzalez as the deliberate attempt to achieve personal gain by individuals who falsify or change their ethnic identity. Universities wash their hands of any ethical responsibility they have for these fraudulent students. Universities continue their complicity in the erasure of indigenous peoples because it makes managing students easier. Furthermore, universities do not want Indigenous students who make demands. Their favorite students are the ones who check the box, indicating an Indigenous ind identity that they do not have. These fraudulent students are the ones who satisfy the diversity requirement without making demands of the university, without rocking the boat or asking for too much. Moreover, these fraudulent students are recruited to sit on committees because they do not challenge the university to act on their responsibilities to Indigenous students and Indigenous lands. In the eyes of the university, fake Indigenous students are the favorites because of they take up the right amount of space. Overall, my work aims to influence the experience of Indigenous students have at post-secondary institutions. While the experiences of Indigenous students are influenced by student services, local Indigenous communities, presence of Indigenous faculty, this work aims to mitigate the harm done by non-Indigenous students who pretend to be Indigenous and mark themselves as such on a university admissions forms. I'm interested in which questions schools are asking right now about their Indigenous students' identity, which are unnecessary and which questions are missing. In this dissertation, I'm focusing on post-secondary institutions and their students, and I'm not addressing the instances of non-Indigenous faculty or staff. The long-term goal of this work is to improve the Indigenous student experience by underlining the erasure of Indigenous identities through unregulated self-identification practices. I'm calling this practice of self-Indigenization box checking and therefore is done by box checkers. Box checking is not a harmless act because it's when non-Indigenous students put themselves in a category to compete with Indigenous students for funding, scholarships, and research opportunities that they are not only lying about their identity, but also erasing student voices. Better said, winning an Indigenous student award when you're not Indigenous sends the message that Indigenous students do not exist, nor do they matter. There's a massive amount of white privilege in being able to take over a label assigned to someone else because there's someone out because someone is missing out on or deserves. It is bold. Furthermore, it's believing indigeneity only exists inside a tiny box marked on an application and they are redefining what the box American Indian, Alaskan Native or First Nations, Métis or Inuit means on these forms. Sitting next to and supporting non-Indigenous students checking the box are the post-secondary administrators who allow it to happen. As non-Indigenous students check the box, rely on the indigeneity only existing inside a demographic box. Said another way, if indigeneity only exists inside a box, then these institutions do not have to provide any additional supports or services to Indigenous students. It becomes an ideal instance of diversity and inclusion because institutions can show their demographic numbers and say they have diversity because they have all these fraudulent box checkers. At the same time, they do the bare minimum, if anything, for their students, their indigenous students. I decided to focus my research on box checkers because at the core of this issue, it is the indigenous student experience that it hinders. One could create the best student service program, but in serving non-Indigenous students because they've checked the box. 
Additionally, the program would have to do additional work to verify the indigeneity of the students they're supporting to show why they should use their resources or should not use their resources on box checkers, work that should be done at the point of admissions. Likewise, the program will struggle to be seen as successful because the intended student population, indigenous students, are not the ones being served. Instead, it's box checkers who don't participate in anything and end up skewing the data. If box checkers were siphoned off sooner, the program and its indigenous students would be able to match the needs to services and make services tighter because they will be serving the students who need their services and whom the services were meant for. I'm not going to talk about why people check non-Indigenous people check the Indigenous box because I'm not interested in studying identity nor psychology, but instead I'm going to focus on how institutions are responsible for allowing this to happen, why they let it continue, and alternative methods to identifying Indigenous students. As an Indigenous researcher, I can't allow institutions to create the solution to fix the box checker problem because they've already shown us what they think indigeneity means, and they're clearly wrong. Focusing this work on the issues of self-identification practices and post-secondary institutions as a means to indig indicate indigeneity will provide clarity to a very specific instance of box checking and how it impacts indigenous students. The clarity this research provides will allow student service providers to focus their energy on students instead of fighting the white supremacist box checking occurring in their programs. In order to provide alternatives to self-identification practices, this research is driven by indigenous feminist theories because they teach us how to be in good relations with one another at our most generous. As an example of this practice of care and relationality, I'm going to use indigenous introductions to show how indigeneity is not confined to a box and is relational. Plainly speaking, indigenous introductions show us how indigenous people identify one another and I hope using our own methods for identifying one another can be something that replaces the box that white supremacist non-Indigenous folks have created to identify themselves and us. Focusing on how self-identification is susceptible to non-Indigenous students claiming indigeneity and providing alternatives that are relation-based will make it easier for student service providers to assist Indigenous students without fighting the administration about incorrect data. So that all said, these are my research questions for my dissertation that I'm working on. Um, the first one being, what is the message self-identification processes send to Indigenous students about how the universities understand their indigeneity? Which in other words means because universities understand and the only time they collect this type of information is really just like in an ethnic box. And so Indigenous folks are more than an ethnic people. We also have a political stance. We also have sovereignty. We also have we're citizens of different nations. So there has to be something more than just one small box. And I'm having I'm asking students to comment about how that impacts their experience at school. Uh, the second question is, what do Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee introductions tell us about how they define indigeneity and what kind of relationships and kidships are included? How can, so that one, I decided that I was thought back to like when I was a child and every time that I met like another indigenous student in the community, whether it didn't matter if it was at a powwow or a community event that everybody always asks you when you're a kid, like who your mom is. And if they don't know who your mom is, then they wanna know like who your grandparents are. And then like once you tell them who you are and who, who you're related to, who your kin is, then they tend to like understand who you are. And then they can put you into context and figure out if there's like relations that they know that you know that you might have in common. So it was like thinking back to that and that is how we, how like going to different schools and meeting different indigenous folks from different places, like that is always the very first conversation that we have is like, where are you from? And do you know such and such? So I'm, I'm trying to capitalize on, capitalize is the wrong word. I'm trying to like capture what it is that introductions can help us with and then trying to figure out how we can use indigenous introductions to identify indigenous students in a university admissions process. In a nutshell, 
just a really large nutshell. So I'm using indigenous feminist theories that are to try to figure out how to identify indigenous students. Um, I'm thinking that if we require documentation of ancestry, it can be really unreliable. And there are universities who require documentation of status, enrollment, or blood quantum, but it doesn't consider indigenous students who may have been removed from their communities. Uh, students who have been adopted out of their communities may not have access to these blood quantum papers of their parents, and they will have a difficult time trying to provide the proper documentation. In addition, asking students for status or like federal recognition papers is problematic because these systems were created by white supremacist state sanctions. Um, for example, in what is now called Canada, the recognition system is based on status versus non-status, which is based on the Indian Act and does not include Métis or Inuit indigenous communities, only First Nations. One of the largest impacts that on status that the Indian Act had is that white women who married indigenous men gained status. However, indigenous women who married white men lost their status, which means people who are not indigenous would then have status. So that's like not a very good system. The Indian Act was put into place to control and disappear indigenous communities and should not be used as a type of documentation to verify indigenous students' identity. Similarly, federal recognition of tribal nations is what in what is now called the United States is overseen by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a federal government entity that was established to maintain the millions of acres of land for indigenous communities. As oppressors, both federal governments of Canada and the United States built systems designed for the erasure of indigenous people, not to prove our existence, our worth, or our right to live. Pushing forward, pushing towards an identification model that focuses on tribal sovereignty, university policies could require indigenous community recognition, meaning tribal identification cards or a letter to verify a particular student is involved in a said indigenous community. However, um, we need to consider the fact that this could also be an issue because standards and conversations need to be created with local communities concerning what is acceptable and what is not acceptable because it's not like the universities know which, which tribes are valid and which ones are fake organizations with cards. For folks who left their communities for safety reasons, such as domestic violence, abuse, or homophobia, they also might not have the access to get the verification that they need. And given that not all tribes or nations have federal recognition or status, not all people have access to the genealogical or blood quantum records, a new verification process that provides care to our relatives and is driven by indigenous feminist theories is, nece is a necessary next step in the fight against ethnic fraud. Indigenous feminist theories then necessitate a pushback against the university self-identification processes while lifting, up while lifting up tribal communities to set a new imaginary that does not allow others to steal our identities and box us out of the institutions that occupy our lands. Indigenous feminist theories also ask us to focus on decolonization and sovereignty something that box checking does not focus on. As it stands, post-secondary institutions are deciding who's indigenous and who is not, a sovereign power that has been removed from indigenous people because they're allowing fraudulent folks and fraudulent students to check this box and not checking them at all, checking, checking, and not having any sort of like ethical problem with that. We should be the ones who are deciding who's indigenous and who's not. Furthermore, Indigenous feminists asks us to consider how being in good relations with our kin can best be realized. For example, this my research is considering the ones who've been adopted or ripped away from their families and those who are part of the 60 scoop or our relations who are two-spirited trans and otherwise gender non-conforming. When speaking to the recognition of indigeneity, all of our relations who have been taken away or pushed out need to be included because it is the responsible move to make. So what might happen if indigenous introductions were used in place of self-identification methods? The first thing to occur when you meet someone new is an introduction in a Western context that usually includes one's name, a place of work, and sometimes your city of residence. 
but I'm more concerned with introductions to other Indigenous people, more specifically Indigenous language introductions. Meaning a typical introduction to another Indigenous person usually includes one's first and last name, parents or grandparents' name, Indigenous communities of which one's a citizen or has relation to. What usually follows is a discussion of the relatives that the other person may or may not know as an attempt to put into context and establish there is a relational connection. An Indigenous introduction, sometimes it's in an Indigenous language and sometimes it's not. Not everybody might speak their language, but they still know what I'm finding is that they still know who, um, how to, what information is included, which means that it includes things like details about your relation to land, where you're from, to your community, who you're from, to your responsibilities to your community, like your clan, your spirit name, which describes your responsibilities in the world and to yourself. I want to stress how Indigenous introductions identify key relational responsibilities Indigenous students come to campus with and how these are not conveyed in box checking practices. An Indigenous introduction describes the ways in which Indigenous people know, relate, and create their worlds. Understanding the ways Indigenous people approach introductions for one another is a framework for how institutions can understand indigeneity and identifying Indigenous students. So the aim of my data collection is to compare the way that universities identify Indigenous students with the way that Indigenous folks identify themselves. Because nearly all universities use a self-identification method on their admissions forms, the first research question is focusing on the message self-identification sends to Indigenous students. How does box checking how does box checking shape how the university understands indigeneity? How does this type of box checking method influence their experience in university? What do Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee introductions tell us about Indigenous relationality? What kind of information is included? Uh, and given the information that's included in an in induction, how do Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people understand what it means to be Indigenous? And then how can these Indigenous introductions be used to identify Indigenous students in a university admissions process? Because um, I also want to note that because both Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples exist and have existed on both sides are what, of what is currently known as the US and, and Canada, I have asked these questions to students in Canada and in the US. And I'm focusing on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee students because my project is based in Toronto and that they are the traditional caretakers of that land. So the students that I interviewed, I had 20, I have 28 so far. I need like three more. So like if you're out there, shoot me a, shoot me a line and we'll definitely get it done. Um, they, they answered questions about their experiences with box checking. They answered questions about how they identify themselves. They answered questions about um, what they thought about um how they identify themselves and then what they thought that that kind of meant then i also asked them to somehow figure out how we could use those in forms and so here are some of my results these are like initial results some of the things that surprised me is because i was interviewing Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe students, they had to be grad students because I wanted folks who had been to multiple schools and then might have had multiple different kinds of experiences at those universities. That 26 out of the 28 of them that I've talked to definitely know a case of ethnic fraud, definitely know the, a case of like box checking. Sometimes it was other students, sometimes it was faculty, sometimes it was elders, and sometimes they saw these things happening in the classroom. Sometimes it was over the Indigenous student organization, and sometimes it was community pu people pushing their way into the university and trying to say that they're the experts. But in all these cases, all of these students felt invisible on campus as an Indigenous person, and they had to find their own way to like connect with either other Indigenous folks or other students of color. 
after having students describe their introductions to me, uh, these are the, some of the things that they included, which I thought was like interesting because the only introduction that I knew before this was the Anishinaabe one. So like hearing what Haudenosaunee introductions include, I was like, hey, we're kind of all related. This is really working well. Um, they'd include their spirit name, which if we, which tells us like what responsibilities they have to their community and to themselves. They would talk about their clans, which they defined as it meant that, that those are the responsibilities that they had to their community. Um, they would also mention their community and their nation. So if they're Odawa, like me, then they would also say like which band or which tribe, not tribe, but like which nation they came from. Yeah, which reserve they came from. Um, they also all mentioned the land where their people came from and then everybody as also added like where they currently live. So when I asked them the questions of like, how do we capture this information? Um, a lot of them suggested doing essays where like students would explain what the kind of information that would be inside of their introduction and talk about who they are or if they were folks that were disconnected from their communities, then this would be a space where they would be able to explain how that happened and what's going on. And it's not like there's going to be an indigenous student or an indigenous person who's gonna read the submissions file and be like, oh, you were disconnected, then that means that you're no longer a part of that. Like everybody knows what happened and everybody knows what colonialism has done to our communities. Um, some instead said that instead of doing essays, because that's a lot of labor to put on students who are probably first generation and like trying to apply to school in, in general is like such a labor intensive thing that they didn't think that that would be fair to put extra work on the students. And so some suggested like extra boxes or extra lines be filled in. So like um, one example was like, if it asked you if you're indigenous, then it would like open up a new box and then the new box would be like, which tribe? Then the box after that would say like, um, like where's your family from? And just in order to like kind of be able to have more details that would be included in an introduction, but like somehow not make those like super labor intensive. There were other students who talked more about um, what kind of work that that because those um, what kind of work that would mean for like the the universities that they would need to have someone who is either like a part of these admissions meetings because they also talked about how it would have to be an indigenous person who's reading these things or at least someone who understands that and catches the nuances that happen in all of these essays. Um, but they definitely talked about how in order to, ex to enhance or make their experiences at university better, that administrators of these universities need to have better relationships with the local tribes to kind of understand like what it is that they're doing and what it is that their communities that are near them need. Uh, one of the questions that I got like more than once was students who talked about like, what if your school that you're going to is not on your homeland, then how would you introduce yourself? And I feel like you could do two things. You could figure out how those folks introduce themselves in that territory, and you could just make sure that you include that information, or you could just introduce yourself the way that your people introduce, yourself, introduce themselves. And that way it's still keeping to how like indigenous people define themselves and we're not defining who one another is for each other. And it's still something that is like sovereign. So as these are little baby uh, research stories of like what's happening, um, I have some final thoughts about what's going on and where I'm gonna go from here. Um, I'm working with this concept of box checking to describe the information about Indigenous people that's captured through self-identification practices. I'm defining box checkers as people who check the racial or ethnic box indicating they're American Indian, Alaskan Native, or Ab Aboriginal when they're not. Um, and the extent of their supposed indigeneity only goes as far as the box without any relations or ties to Indigenous communities. Um, I'm trying to keep 
them out because I feel like their definition of what indigeneity is, is defined to this like very small box. And that is not something that is inclusive to how complex indigenous um, identity is. And while I believe there's value in using indigenous sovereignty and saying that we're a nation to nation um, type of status, and that's why we should be able to define who we are. I think that um, we have to move beyond this argument because we need to incorporate our own indigenous ontologies. Therefore, bringing and comparing Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe introductions and conversation with one another makes me wonder what they might say about identifying indigenous students in the admissions process. Um, this work, I'm aiming to explore how universities understand indigeneity with current self-identification practices and why the implementation of a new process would demonstrate any, a better understanding of what being indigenous means, and that would closer resemble how we see ourselves. Um, box checking only highlights a racial or ethnic understanding of indigeneity, but through these introductions, I'm finding that there's so much more than that. We're talking about land, we're talking about our relations, we're talking about where our people have been, we're talking about big bodies of water, and we're talking about responsibilities to our communities and to, our, and to each other. So I feel like using Indigenous ways of introducing ourselves can offer new possibilities in identifying Indigenous students and provide universities a new understanding of indigeneity that reduces the number of fraudulent claims while maintaining a good relational practice. That's it for me, miigwech. All right, thank you, Sandy. I'm, I think your uh, talk has produced many questions in the chat and uh, we'll get to those later. We now we're, I wanna turn it over to, uh, to Jacques uh, Watso from, uh, Abenaki Nation in, uh, in Canada from Odena. Um, so Jacques, I'm gonna let you do most of your introduction. I appreciate you being with us tonight as well. Yes, sir. Am I on? Yes. Hello, my name is Jacques uh, Terio Watso. I'm an Abenaki from the community of Odenac in Southern, Southern Quebec. Uh, I'm uh, what you may call a French Indian. So uh, I have a slight accent, but bear with me. I am uh, an Abenaki and under the Indian Act, like I said, but the province of Quebec is composed of 11 First Nations. And of those First Nations, Abenaki is one of them. And we have two communities, which is Odenac and Wadinac, our sister community, which is not far from here. And uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Unsettling Genealogy Forum for inviting me. Because yesterday I reached out to Liana, who is a Cherokee, and she is living basically the same situation as the Abenaki. And there's a lot of topics about pretend Indians and race shifting and uh, pseudo Indians and all that all across Turtle Island. But I'll focus on the state of Vermont and uh, New England, which is my traditional territory. But before I start, I'd just like to shout out to my American cousin, Jason, who's uh, online tonight. and. Uh, as an indigenous man, uh, just a, a quick introduction. I'm an elected official on, the, on our council. I've been here for seven mandates and I'm uh, actively involved in uh, fighting cultural appropriation and identity theft, not just of the Abenaki, but it's a big phenomenon in uh, Quebec because Quebec was populated by France, a new France, and uh, at the origin of uh, the colony before the conquest of 1759, there was a lot of mixed marriages and today, the French Canadian are uh, are lost in their identity, where the social, anyways, their their, their social collective uh, society is uh, not falling through. So they're trying to claim indigenous identity through uh, uh, and uh, those mixed marriages from the 1600s, which we'll talk about later on. But uh, the history of my nation comes our traditional territories from New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine and southern quebec so from the united states from odenac my community it's a two-hour drive to go to the united states that uh, fictional border that uh, divides our traditional territories and with the arrival of the british and then the americans we were pushed further north with the through history and we were pushed uh all the way up to odenac and today we're under the indian act so we, us it's a reserve and uh, we have a tribal list and all that and 
we'll talk about the phenomenon of uh, race shifting and pretend Indians. So people in Vermont would come to Odenak in the 90s and over there in uh, New England, they started a new age hippie uh, connecting with the, uh, the pan-Indian mysticism and people started to, 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 um, adi- uh, to, to uh, get involved in these movements. So they'd come to Odenak to get teachings on our language, on our storytelling, on our legends, on our, uh, our specialty of the Wabanaki nations is the uh, basket weaving made out of black ash splints. And that's uh, an art craft that, that we have and um, we still have today. So they'd come to teach, to learn. And like all indigenous, we would ask, um, you know, what's your kinship? What's your identity? So back then in the 90s and, and the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, internet wasn't around. And people would just say, well, we're from the Abamsuin family, which is one of the bigger Abeneki families. And we knew we lost people through the diaspora of our nation because people would be always be traveling. Why I'm, I salute my cousin is because like his family lived in Odenak, but they left and they established themselves in Waterbury, Connecticut because of work. And they, most of the people here were, were guides for the, the, the Americans that would come to Quebec for hunting and uh, they appreciated their native guides. So like my uncles and Jason's and my cousin's uncles, they would, um, they would get hired by these business people. So they would go back on our traditional territories. Like my family went to Albany, New York and his family to Waterbury, Connecticut. So they spread out through New England. And so they were, everybody was on the territory coming and leaving Odenak for work or, uh, or to go sell baskets. And uh, so this, everybody was, uh, all spread up. So in the 90s, they, they would come, these people, and after we started asking questions, like more in-depth questions, like, okay, you say you're from the Abamsuin, but which lineage, what family, and uh, that's when the complications started because they all have the same stories. And through this panel, I see that it's always the same pattern with either your Cherokee or your, uh, your Ojibwe or your your Apache, it's all the same thing. It's always the same pattern where they, they, they have a fictional or um, they have like this Indian princess Cherokee here in Southern Quebec. It's the, the Indian grandmother, which they can't identify or, um, or they, they, they try to link themselves to this, this, um, this myth, that, the family myth that they had an indigenous family uh, over here. So the people in Vermont, they started, um, they started uh, regrouping and uh, organizing themselves. And my uncle, who used to be chief here in uh, Odenak in the 70s, he was a, uh, a friend of one of those those leaders down in Vermont. And uh, his name was Homer. And he's like the, the, the first one that started all the all this uh, pretend Indian tribes in Vermont. So they started doing a... Um, a, uh, a, a, a BIA federally recognition process to get the, the tribes in Vermont, the Abenaki tribes in Vermont recognized. So there was only one tribe. So they went through the whole process of uh, recognition. So they started doing their genealogy and they submitted their genealogy, but they uh, found out that the only people that were indigenous in those groups were people from my community that were living, still living in, in Vermont. So there was about 19 uh, individuals that had direct link with my community that were on their little band list of their 2000 band members. And they hired a genealogist, but they, um, he, he told them through uh, rigor, rigorous uh, work that they weren't Abenaki, they weren't indigenous. So they hired someone else who found indigenous ancestry to everybody. So they went through the BI process. They got uh, canceled in the late 1990s or early 2000. So they started, they. There was a session, so they all disbanded and formed four different groups. It was in 2005, 2007. They, uh, they disbanded, and then they started the process of state recognition to four groups, and they pulled away from the BIA um, standards of uh, uh, proving your genealogy, because you got to prove, like, 
like me, I'm indigenous because my parents are indigenous and so on. And that's how, uh, that's how it is. You can't invent yourself an ancestor or a parent. Uh, and that's how gene genealogy worked. So they all have this story down in Vermont where they, uh, they were hiding in plain sight. They uh, were victim of the eugenic system. If you speak to Nabenek in Vermont, they will press play and you will hear the same thing. They got it down pat where the, you know, they, are, um, they were hiding in plain sight. They were, um, they were, uh, they were victim of uh, eugenics and racism. But at the same time, the people from my community were, like I said, they were uh, master basket weavers. They would spend six months out of the year in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine selling baskets to, uh, to uh, the tourists because there was a lot of outfitters, outfitters uh, campsites for, for the, in New England for the tourists. Now everybody goes to Mexico, but back then they'd go to Vermont by the beach, by Champlain Lake and uh, this and that. So they had a Beneke stand that from 1900 to the 1950s when they, the tourism died down and they were there while these pretend Indians were claiming that they were hiding. There were over 15,000 people of them that were hiding in plain sight when we were there with our big signs like Abenaki Indians selling baskets and my, my uncles, um, I got pictures of my uncle in 1936 with full regalia, uh, taking pictures with the um, tourists and doing the whole Indian bit for uh, to amuse the tourists, all that good. It was, it was a way to, to sell the baskets. And now these uh, groups, they, they formed and they, um, they are claiming my heritage, my languages, my stories, and the stories of all my Abeneki uh, brothers and sisters of Odenak and Wolinak as their own. And they are redefining my culture and heritage, and they are placing their people in academy, academia or in, in all the schools to speak on our behalf and, va and validate, not on our behalf, but speak on behalf of these fake tribes to validate their pretensions and uh, they got state recognition in 2011 where we intervened as a, a first nation and then we got kicked out because they said we were expatriates because we were living in canada which is a two-hour drive from here and they they use all the tactics that i i've learned through the different panelists over here they, it's all it's the same same thing that happened with the abenaki in vermont or these pretend indian today they are uh, pretending to be Abenaki. They are basically telling me and my, the people of my community that we are not living our culture the way it's supposed to be lived. Hence, they will live it for us. And like uh, Liana said yesterday, they are erasing us to replace us, which is a fact, and we are living it on a daily basic basis. And um, the, uh, the reason that I reached out to Liana is because on April the 29th, we are going to the University of Vermont because there are still uh, uh, honest researchers in the state of Vermont that don't abide by what these fake tribes are imposing on, on, the, uh, on the schools and on the governments. And when uh, an academic, a sur uh, historian, anthropologist has the audacity to ask these people, uh, these pretend Indians in Vermont that uh, what is, you know, they said, uh, like in an example, they say my grandmother, she changed her name, but what was her name before, you know, because uh, like I'm a Watso and that's a traditional Abenaki name and Vermont is like a two hour drive from here. And of those 15,000 Abenaki over there, not one has an indigenous Abenaki traditional name. And there is, um, there's a lot of uh, sadakus, there's a lot of nolets and wawa nolets, and uh, these are all traditional Abenaki name, names, not Mi'kmaq, not, uh, not uh, Penobscot or Passamaquoddy, which are Wabenaki, but the, the specific Abenaki names that are still here today, and we're just, you cross, uh, you go two hours down there, and there's not one historical name that persists or lives or lives on, which is uh, basically impossible there, but uh, 
it's uh, it's shameful because they are speaking on our behalf and are they, we are pushing us out of the, the scene. And now that you, like I said, we're going to the University of Vermont to tell our side of the story. We're not, uh, we're not, uh, we just want to tell the, our side of the story, which is that the, we were like kind of forced out of there and they just, they moved in because Vermont, New Hampshire and Maine was colonized at the beginning of the century, 19th century by French Canadians uh, during the, the industrial revolution. A lot of, because French, uh, French Quebec was um, an agricultural society, Catholic, very religious. And there was like poverty and all that. So they went to the States to work and it's, and most of the people in Vermont, they have, uh, there are Franco, uh, Franco Americans or French Canadian descent. And most of them, they, they did that race shifting thing where they um, they don't want to acknowledge their own French Canadian heritage. It's more um, it's more uh, it's more validating to, to to become an Indian. But they don't take our trauma. They don't take our our pain and suffering. They don't take uh, the impacts of residential school. Just today I was in an interview with the CBC and. Uh, I was asked to react on the Pope's apology and I said, well, you know, it is what it is there, but it's kind of too late there for all the suffering that the, the church imposed on the on the natives, you know. Like I told CBC, if uh, God wanted me to be Catholic, uh, a little white Catholic, he would have made me a little white Catholic in the beginning. So anyways, these people in Vermont are, like I said, they're telling us that we're not living our culture the way it should be lived. They will live it for us. So now they're applying for grants and they are a nonprofit organization before state recognition. So you could get grants and as a nonprofit, but once they receive these grants, it validates their pretension of, of being indigenous because in the grant, they don't, they, they wouldn't mention being indigenous or whatnot, just a, a nonprofit. So it validates their pretensions. And when they went for state recognition, we were, boosted out of the Senate, and it was a purely political decision of the Senate of Vermont to uh, grant this uh, state recognition to these tribes. And it's like a political game where you, you let me play Indian and they give me some money and I'll vote for you. And that's how I see it on a political level. And these people are, they put the a lot of uh, teachers and researchers and anthropologists that emerged from these groups in posi key positions in schools as being uh, researchers, historians, to validate all the pretensions. So the pretensions, while well, the, the position of the real indigenous people in New England is not being listened, and they are, um, they are playing the role of a, of our own people and that, that is very frustrating and then now that we are raising our hand in the in the um, in opposition to their pretension we are being treated uh, as as children we are being patronized we are being told that we are racist we are being told that we are uh, colonized indian act indians doing the work and the bidding of the federal government i even Ottawa or in Washington, we are uh, not not uh, working. And I learned the word this morning was spiritual bypassing. I'm being told that uh, since I speak, I'm 47 years old and I'm being treated like a toddler, but I'm being told since I, I'm denouncing these groups that uh, I'm not a true Abenaki because a true Abenaki would not speak the way that I speak and I would not uh, insult not I'm not insulting these people but I'm not um, I'm uh, see I have a hard time to express myself in English there but uh, I'm, I'm not uh, a good enough Indian so my my what I'm saying isn't valid so we got to push that away and their pretensions are more valid because it's all comes down to uh, to making money because uh, I saw what uh, Bernie Sanders he had a relief package there for Vermont and he put a three thousand and some dollars in it for one of these tribes to preserve our the culture and language but they're preserving a culture and language that is not theirs 
I have no objection for someone that comes to my community and says, I want to learn your culture and uh, learn a few uh, stories, but like the ceremonies are sacred. There are ceremonies and certain aspect of culture you cannot share. And, uh, but we're more than welcoming, like, um, like all the First Nations across the, uh, the Americas. But there's certain things you can't, you can't share there. But they they took all all that is beautiful and they're merchand merchandising it to uh, their own benefits and profit, and they are um, they are causing damage as the Cherokees as the other tribes. But this concerns me because it's my culture and heritage that are exploiting. And there are uh, I'll do some name dropping. There's uh, Joe Bruchak who's a writer and he's been in the movement so that since the seventies. And he came to our community and he got all our stories and he marketed our stories. And you can't, um, you can't trademark legends or stories of a nation because they're not an individual creation, they're a collective creation. So he can exploit and he plays on their nuance that he's of a Beneki heritage and all. They play on these words that uh, uh, a normal white person doesn't see the nuance or the differences where indigenous people, um, they know, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Beneki or indigenous ancestry, then we all know that we're talking like uh, many gener many generations. Of. So they're speaking on our behalf and they're be there are the reference for the Beneki. So people won't come to see us and say, see these people, they're doing it better than you guys, because that's all they have to do. And at the same time, people in my community, they, they want to live their life because when you're indigenous, it's like you're born uh, an activist and you always got to be spot on and defending each and every cause every day, single day. We can't live our lives. We got to be fighting all these plus assume that they not assume, but uh, um, take care of our own internet intergenerational traumas and take care of our communities and develop our own communities and to move forward at the same time in a positive way and heal from our traumas and break the cycles of violence of uh, the, our past and uh, it's hard it's heavy and uh, then you got these people running around doing whatever and do and misrepresentate misrepresenting my nation and it's frustrating at the same time, I was told by one of these chiefs that one day you'll come crawling back to Vermont to learn your own culture, your own heritage, and your own language from us. So that is very um, well, blasphemy. It's very um, frustrating and condescending, and it's very racist and uh, the colonialism, colonialism that they're denouncing when we intervene is what they're imposing on us they're treating us like a like a white supremacist or a, a racist individual would do they're saying i'm white but i'm playing an indian but i'm white so i still have that white privilege over you and i'm a better indian than you because i'm white and i as a white person i cannot be contradicted yeah that's about it but that's the situation so, so what do we do to fight this is a, a you, you gotta keep your community involved in uh, this this dialogue. You gotta keep uh, uh, educating your own people because you uh, we have uh, what's the word uh, the defend Indians that are protecting these people that help these people in the '90s and 2000s. I'm talking about the, the Vermont situation, and today they they kind of don't want to admit that they got duped. So they're doubling down on the lies that the pretend Indians are doubling down on. So it's a big cycle of uh, nonsense of, and um, it's like it shattered egos that don't want to admit that we got uh, we got double crossed by uh, some war, some pretend Indian French American um, Vermonters and uh, and that's Hitler. So uh, like I said, this those pretend Indians are in the system validating the pretend Indians and they are totally erasing the true Indians from the, the whole history, from the whole picture. 
So that's what's going on down here. And they are more outspoken, the fact that they're in the States and there's like this this border that, that, that like they say, we're expatriates and we don't deserve to, uh, we don't deserve to uh, exist there. But there's um, there was a woman on, on, on chat, her name is Jean Kent. She, I don't see her, see her there no more, but uh, she's one of these pretend Indian, and she intervened a couple of times on this panel, and uh, they're very aggressive, and they're very, the more you speak out, the more aggressive they are, and she brought out a blog, and it, it's always to bring down the indigenous voice, always because they got too much to lose, and they invested too much time and energy to and they're profiting too much. Like Bruce Aikis, the family is evaluating a couple of millions off books and storytelling in academia that they're doing and that they are profiting from my culture and heritage. And they say they honor our memory. Uh, they honor the Abeneki. They are not, they are profiting. They are taking the place of an indigenous voice and they are speaking on our behalf when we never ask them to speak on our behalf. Well, they, when you say you are honoring us, you are not honoring us. You are profiting for us. They came here with a with a smile and a, a kind uh, kind words, but they were evil, not evil there, but they were. Um, they knew what they were doing, and they knew uh, that uh, they profited from our uh, our goodwill. They profited from our kindness and our willing to share and now they're telling us um, that uh, we're just a uh, bad bad uh, colonized indian because we have the audacity to try to stop what they're doing because they're trying to save and revive our culture that is not theirs and i told them once you know i like i like uh, karate movies and i like chinese food but that doesn't make me an asian individual i am uh, a beneki and they uh, they are not Abeniki because they put on a, a regalia or they put on a, they speak my language or they they try to do my ceremonies and the ceremonies of my people and uh, you know when I say my culture but I mean the culture of my community and it's very frustrating. So this unsettling genealogy form is very important for me. I saw that I was not alone in this fight, that it was something that was going on everywhere and that people are fighting. And after that, people will start uh, reaching out and talking to each other, and wheels are in motion and uh, with uh, with the different communities because of these forms. And it's a it's a very important form, and it's a, it's not every indigenous people because people they have a lot to lose. I will say something that my my wife she's an artist and she's from another nation of Quebec. She's at Sikamek. And uh, she spoke out against um, cultural appropriation in the arts, because in Quebec, there's a lot of pretend Indians and wannabes that are in the art system, because the federal and provincial government, they give out a lot of arts grants. And you got more chance to get an Indian grant than the, the, the applicants for the white grant. So um, everybody sticks a feather in their heads. And she started to speak out. But the people deciding are pretend Indians too, but now they're being called out them too. You know, there's Michelle Latimer in the cinema, the, the Susie Keys uh, in, in Northern Ontario, she pretended to be Abenaki, and there's different individuals that are um, starting to get booted out. But the artists are afraid to speak because the people in charge are the pretend Indians giving out the grants. So they're not giving out the grants to the indigenous voice, they're giving out the grants to the pretend Indians. And once you get a grant, you validate your position and it reinforces your your lies and uh, and uh, that's it i think you get to get you get the, the 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 picture of the the people so i would just like to state that the the uh, state recognized tribes of vermont there are four of them we as the abenaki people of odanak and wolanak we do not recognize them we put out statements we put out resolutions and it, it was just brushed aside because they're laughing at us now because they got what they wanted and now they're they're, they're going solo and they're, they're collecting the, the juicy money from the state of vermont oh that too but i think that like the taxpayer of vermont is being um, lied to because they're the one basically that are paying these grants that goes to these tribes and they are they are taking treaty 
uh, treaty um, treaty uh, benefits, like they, they passed a law on fishing, they got a right to fish in, in Vermont there, I can't remember the name of the, the program, that it was something that happened this year. So they're, they're stealing our traumas, they're stealing our indigenous rights, they're stealing our treaty rights, they're stealing everything. And, um, and, 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 and that's it. But the people of Vermont, like the, the taxpayer, the French, the, the Vermonters that are paying these things, if these uh, programs are being uh, lied to, and they're being, um, basically their, their tax money is fraudulently given to these, uh, these tribes with the complicity of the, 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 the Vermont state that was duped, or they were uh, misled by these, these, these troops, yeah, these, uh, these tribes. Now, I don't wanna say tribes, but fake tribes there, but uh, that's it. So it's all a big, a big mess. So uh, we're, we're not, uh, we're, we're still keeping up the fight there. And uh, there's, a, there's a University of Vermont is doing a conference in uh, you know, April 29th. And you can tune in uh, on uh, their webinar, uh, and you can uh, go to the go to their uh, their website and get the link, and you can participate and see what's going to go down because they're all going there. All the wannabes are going to be there, and it's going to be very interesting. So, uh, but I got nice allies that I found because of this unsettling genealogies that are going to be there to support me and support the Abenaki of Odin Act to denounce these uh, fake groups, and uh, I think. Uh, they're, they're, are, uh, they, they spoke enough about our culture and heritage. Oh, I see Jacqueline has uh, shared the thing there, the, the, the webinar. So click on it on the chat and then you can go uh, reserve your, your place and attend the, uh, this conference. So like, I'm just a dude from the res. I'm not a big, I'm not a narrator or a, a scholar. I'm just a carpenter that's an elected official and uh, but uh, like yeah, I said, every indigenous person was born an activist. So uh, this is what I wanted to share. And I thank you very much. And if there's got questions about the Abenaki and whatnot there, uh, feel free to ask the questions and I'll try to answer them. And I would like to thank my co-panelists. It's, uh, it's refreshing to see that uh, we are not alone in this struggle. So uh, thank you. Salut. Miigwech, Jaco. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for your words. And uh, we can open it to questions now. I don't, uh, all panelists should be able to see the Q&A if they click on it. If you can't see that, Liana will share questions with you. Um, it, there's a little, I don't know, like a cartoon bubble box in the right-hand uh, corner of your screen down to the right there. And if you hit, hit that Q&A, you'll, you'll see the questions yourself if there's any you want to take on. There aren't a lot of them yet. Um, well, I guess so, there's one. Um, so where do you want to start? Uh, Jacques, do you think it's possible to take the fake groups to court for racketeering? <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question. Well, of course, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you, know, well, you know, we're Canadian, but there's, there's uh, we got a meeting next uh, Wednesday, I think with the uh, Aquasasne and we're gonna start talking and we'll talk and, uh, Wheels are in motion, and there's uh, we are not alone, and it is fraud. There, it's just get the, the whole thing, uh, the wheel in motions, and I think that something can can be done. There. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, I'm seeing a few. There, there's not a whole lot of them. Um, um, Kalia asks, I'm interested in the nuance of indigenous people that one could argue have authentic indigenous experience in the instance of 60s scoop survivors where they were removed from their homes and communities and therefore may have lineage but have no experience, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How do we parse out this dis dis distinction? Is it valid? Um, any, anybody, I don't know, Sandy, um, Jacques, um, Brian, if you're still with us. Yeah, go ahead. I think that it is not something that we can ignore because I think that it happened to just so many folks. Um, it's not something that we can just pretend like it doesn't exist. It definitely does. But I think that if you're 
I think that's like in the case of like when you're applying to something and there is space for you to explain your story, if you were to explain your story and say like, I'm a victim of the 60s scoop, then whoever's reading that on the other end is gonna know what you're talking about. And so I feel like that is like, and that's a very valid experience to be to be detached from your communities and to be detached from your people like on purpose like that and then be in the process of like trying to get it back like I think that's the other part of it is that um, I would I would want to I would want to like encourage that as much as possible of like reconnecting to communities that you didn't have access to or were ripped away from um, because you were thrown into state care. But I think that it's not necessarily something that, that maybe one person can be deciding, but I think like that's where something like a community or like two or three people or like having a conversation, it doesn't mean that you can't call that person and be like, tell me more, like what's going on? And maybe like having all these paperwork doesn't mean that it's going to catch every single fake native, but I think that it's going to stop quite a few of them who think that they can just get away with checking a box because that is all they have ever done. And is it pot potentially possible that somebody who knows about this kind of history could use that to become a fake native as well? And, and also just wonder about the data on that, like what's the pervasiveness of that particular um, 60s scoop? I mean, are there numbers on that? How, how, how uh, anybody know? Uh, how many states I think it was it's more than 60,000 so like the idea that it could be you and then your children would also be affected too because then they wouldn't if you don't have connections to your community then they wouldn't either that actually happened to like one of the students that I interviewed and so it actually took them years I think she said like more than 10 years to get back through the adoptive to get to the paperwork to get through like where they were adopted from to get to like who it was that what their um what community that they belong to, but it was also like work that you have to put in. I think you have to be willing to put in the work to be like, no, this is who I am. You can't just come in and be like, oh, so I think I am, and that might be cool, but like, because what are you trying to prove? Can you all see these questions? I mean, if there are some you want to take on, I don't really, uh, you know, let me let me scroll up to the top. Um, I do see there. there's one directed towards me. Um, oh, at the okay. end, Brian, can you explain your thinking about the term Neo-Indians? Right, that's right at the top, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, thank you for that. I, 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 I didn't coin the term. I adopted it about the same time as another, a number of other researchers. Um, it, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, for someone like myself, who's an anthropologist and a non-native, um, I'm not, I'm coming from a, a point of view of studying various kinds of communities with an effort to understand them without at least, at least reserving judgment initially. And um, it's standard practice in anthropology, for example, to, to avoid the deprecatory terms. Um, and so some anthropologists and other scholars, actually there was a lot of the demographers who were first using this term, seeing the numbers show up in uh, censuses and so on, um, where you can't really ascertain uh, what a person's motives or intentions are. Uh, and Neo-Indian or New Indian at least kind of identified a phenomenon without, um, without needing to know each case, what was the underlying motive. You know, pretendian um, implies some intentional deception. Um, anthropologist Circe Sturm, uh, you, opted for the term race shifter rather than using the term wannabe um, that the, the Cherokees were using um, because it was intentionally insulting. Um, so I mean, it's, it's partly a, a, an issue of professional ethics, uh, but 
um, the, the French anthropologists who've been studying this in Latin America, um, Gallienier and uh, Moligny, who wrote a book, The Neo-Indians, uh, A Religion for the New Age. Um, uh, using the same term. So it has kind of spread. It's got some versatility to it. I'm not advocating that other people pick it up. Um, for those circumstances in which you really don't know what is motivating a person though, it's a useful term to use um, that gives you the ability to say, there's something off. I can't say exactly what, I can't accuse this person of lying without getting myself in legal or ethical trouble. So it's a term you can use under this kind of circumstance. Uh, oh. and that's kind of where it comes from. Gotcha. So Cedar had a question for Sandy as well. Um, thank you for that, Brian. I felt some of your observations hewed closely to the arguments made by fraudsters, specifically with regard to tribal IDs being a divisive and destructive holdover of colonialism. I would argue that tribal IDs reflect the voice, priorities, and legal policy of the collective of sovereign native nations. Dismissing the ability of students from federally recognized tribes to use them to identify themselves feels off. Had institutions like universities honored these cards long, all along, we probably wouldn't have the problems we're having now. Is there a place for this form of identification within the strategy you're putting together? Using our existing communication and knowledge pathways feels fresh and exciting, but I wouldn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say, especially as mimicry for fraudsters is a potent tool that they've always used. And I think, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, Cedar question reflected some of mine as well. Like it, you know, um, it's, it's they always turn colonialism back on people who question their, their fraudulent activities and positioning. And, and so um, that's just another way of doing it. If you say that tribes are colonial institutions, I think that's, that's problematic. And in some ways, isn't it Sandy to, to think of it that way? Yeah, I do. Like I, and I totally agree. And I feel that, and I understand that that is, when you have tribal IDs, then it's you defining who belongs to your community and who doesn't. And I'm not saying that they should be, I didn't mean to say if it sounded like they should all be thrown out, but I just think that like, not, it will not, if we just do cards, it doesn't necessarily catch everybody who is indigenous. Like that's a little bit more of my concern. Like that can't, that's not the one be all yeah. guarantee of like who's indigenous and who isn't because there are folks because of like who their parents are or where their parents are registered, then, then they don't fit into either one of their indigenous communities, even though they might've been raised on one of the reses. So like, I feel like there are just more nuances and I think it's much more complicated than we can to just be like, here's one way we could do it. Like we can ask for a card and an introduction. It just means that like, it's not necessarily like the end all be all to everything. And I totally, like, I get it. I get the question and I get like the point because like, I totally will slap my card down to get <laughs> on a gas too. But um, I just mean that it doesn't necessarily um, catch all the ins and outs of the people who were pushed out of their communities. Yeah. And, and uh, I think there is, there's some nuance too. And and I, th I think some people would say that the, the the idea of descendants, you know, uh, fairly recent descendants, not like nine generations or 10 generations back, you go data mining and genealogies um, would be another way to extend that to a more nuanced view, um, though it wouldn't account for what you're talking about. Um, Deb Reese asked Jacques, can she quote from your remarks tonight? And say yes, Jacques. But it's gonna, it's, uh, it's gonna cost you. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it will cost you as I was told. <laughs> and you can send a check by email or. <laughs> but yes, I don't know who you are or for what uh, diabolical uh, research you're doing. <laughs> but uh, I stand by what I say, and uh, I've been saying the same thing for the last twenty years. Yeah. Um, Getting older. Eh? Other questions you want to take on? Uh, Jacques, there's another for Jacques here, I guess, from, from Doug, Douglas. Uh, you see that one? Yeah, I can't hear you. 
your microphone's off i think yeah it says mm-hmm. shout do you think old neck blindness yes well i i talked about it a bit it's uh because when we um if people want to read the question there but uh, it's like when you're on the res you you wake up in the morning and you got to be on on where these people in vermont they're they're only playing the role of being an indian and uh, they, they only play it when it suits them but us we always had to be uh these Indians on the res and always be uh, spot on and have the answer to every question that we got to be these super Indians and to know the culture, the language, the heritage, uh, to know everything about every plant, every tree, every everything. And people in the community, some are tired of uh, these debates because it's heavy, it's uh, draining, it's, uh, and some people, they just want to live their lives. You know, people, I got some people here that are proud of Beneke men and women and uh, they are involved in their communities, and that's it. They don't want to. They don't want go to go to the front and uh, and take on these groups because they said I have enough issues, and I'd like to live and appreciate my life over here in Odenak and profit from my existence, and not spend all my time like I'm doing and some people are doing, and the activists are the, the roles are important, but they. Uh, it's kind of uh, like like you said in the question. There's this border. There's the distance. There's this language barrier. There's the political and uh, legal structures that are different from a reserve in Canada and the reservation in the states. And there's no uh, state recognition in the provinces. It's all federal. It's federal organization. So we don't have this, these phenomena in. Uh, Canada, but we have we have self-identified groups, but not they won't get uh, recognized by the province of Quebec or the province of Ontario. So uh, we've got different issues, and uh, the dynamics mm. is different from Canada to the United States when it comes to Indigenous. Uh, and m- most of the people in Odenac are francophone, so we're French Indians and. Uh, the language barrier is one issue, and the, the indigenous language from French, indigenous language to the not speaking English, but the terminologies in French and English are very different. So it's hard to, to, to grasp the whole concept, and and uh, people are kind of fed up because there are so many pretend Indians in Quebec and around my community, and we're fighting here, and then we got to go fight in Vermont, and there's there's a another process that's going on in new hampshire that's similar to vermont so they're trying to transpose what the fraud that went on in vermont to the state of uh, new hampshire and now it's moving on to maine so we got to go fight that battle over there and we're all over the place and while we're doing that we are not focusing on our community where much of our resources are needed so uh, it's not uh, laziness on our part but it becomes a heavy burden because we just want to live our life in peace but we have no choice we have to take on these battles but we gotta evaluate so we don't get drained by by fighting this the, the these fake indians these uh, pretend indians and i don't know if i'm clear there but uh, i hope it answers your question mr douglas What else do we have in here? A lot of stuff. Um, uh, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. There was a question from an anonymous attendee wondering about how to better distinguish unrecognized tribal nations. They may have documentation, but perhaps not the resources, financial ability, desire to go through federal recognition. That's actually exactly the circumstance in Chumash country. Um, where you've got uh, one federally recognized group, the San Inez Band, and then um, several uh, well-defined communities of uh, people descended from uh, mission communities. Um, and they're, they're, they are well-documented, um, particularly through the assistance of various ethno-historians, particular my colleague, John Johnson at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, who's be, he's like the number one enemy of all Neo-Indian and Neo-Chumash. Um, I guess I'm, that makes me number two, but 
Um, the uh, the impact of some he so John basically does Chumash research. I do neo Chumash research. Um, between the two of us, we have developed you know pretty substantial um, bodies of evidence um, defining the histories of these different communities, and and the community members themselves have done their own part too of like you know the in the santa barbara community um uh descendants of the last living speaker of of chumash language who has her mother's uh her mother's notebooks and um has worked to learn that stuff and has been helping to publish it uh, publishing it herself and and so on um and uh, in the Ventura community, uh, another family that's uh, uh, consistently been identified as uh, as uh, uh, Venturano Chumash and uh, active for a very very long time and standing up to 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 Neo Chumash. Um, those are some of the people who had initially reached out to us and saying, "Why aren't you guys?" doing something about this. And really it did kind of boil down to being able to catch our colleagues and bust our colleagues in order to bring some of this stuff to light. But um, there is that kind of work that is getting done. And um, like I say, in partnership oftentimes with anthropologists and historians um, who are dedicated to seeing the right thing done there. So those are, you know, look for allies in those circumstances. California is rife with this stuff and California has an odd additional twist that I might bring up. I mentioned this to Gordon the other day. Um, the California land claims were settled over a rather long period of time by compiling judgment rules which were basically genealogies uh, or were, were based on genealogies and submissions by genealogists. And genealogists in the 50s and 60s thought that the Spanish community had absorbed all of the coastal Native Americans and, and so went and explored there. Well, there was a loophole in the way this um, federal um, claims was written. And it said basically that anyone with an ancestor identified as Indian on something like June 1st, 1850 in California, um, would qualify to, for uh, a share of the payout. What that meant in the end was that if you um, were entirely of Spanish colonial descent, but had an ancestor within that Spanish colonial community who at one time or another had been described on a document as an Indio, you qualified and now you occupied a new nebulous status called California Indian with no tribal affiliation. And it was later determined you would qualify for federally funded Indian healthcare because of that. I think we've got a we've got a few more, and uh, we'll read a few more, and maybe maybe close it up for the night. Um, let me see. I saw one. H. Cruz, the Pentagon has contracts for indigenous cultural education that is used by fake tribes to enter the grant arena outside of the military space and in the civilian municipality and state levels. The private grant providers are very motivated by this show of authenticity and reliability. What can be done to make people aware that the Pentagon is in the standard of ind indigenous authenticity? Uh, that's uh, anyone want to take that one on? Thanks for the information. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, yeah, I didn't know about that. <laughs> is, there, is there a question? Yeah, yeah, what can be done about, yeah, using that as a standard of authenticity? Yeah, true. Uh, I don't know, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, maybe other people are. Um, I see one more, maybe. Most all are. Uh, 
Kalia, I guess it is, are they being trained to be the best university box checking indigenous people? I'm not sure about the full scope of that question. Um, anybody? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I kind of get... answer yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe that's the answer. Yeah, long answer. I'm dealing with like four generations of Neo Chumash at this point, maybe five. They're raised in this. They, the, the young ones, have no idea their ancestors were not Chumash. They have no idea. Yeah, yeah. they're trained to it. Yeah, so I'm not seeing that Jacqueline raised the question. I don't see that one you're talking about, Jacqueline. Um, there's a question in here. Uh, hold on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it, the question was, I, regard, I do remember seeing it. Um, if we begin to consult tribes regarding verification of citizenship, how does this not impact the status of our sovereignty? This line of thinking opens a can of worms. There must be another way to provide a way to reconnect for those taken. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, anyone? I think going back to the tribes regarding verification is the first step. Excellent. Yes, I would agree. Here, uh, we're under the Indian Act, and uh, according to the Indian Act, we they, they got a, ban, a registered list, and they give us a ban number. But uh, we have the option to create our own citizenship code, and that's what we did in Odenak, and we decide who our tribal members are. Some are not status, and some are, are but uh, uh, we have control of our, our, our ban list, and we determine who's... Uh, who's a Beneke and who's not within the band of Odenak. And our sister community in Wadinak, they have the same uh, citizenship code, which is different from ours, but it's similar, but they, they, it's the same principle. They get to decide who is a band member and who is not, because we know who our people are, not Ottawa. So uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know about the states there, but in Canada, a lot of tribes are, are uh, establishing their own citizenship codes. Initially, the, the San Inez band of, of Chumash were, were one of the hardest hit by uh, the appearance of Neo Chumash. But uh, with the passage of time, the San Inez band um, developed one of the most prosperous uh, casinos in the country. And um, they've since moved away from really strong involvement in this issue. Um, they've got enough political and uh, financial clout that they don't worry about it so much. Their, their individual members do, but there are also some individual members there who were drawn into the expression of tradition that was developed by Neo Chumash. So that kind of became complicated. And um, if you were to rely on consulting just, say, the the Santa Inez band, um, that could be problematic for the Ventura and Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo communities. Um, it's just uh, complicated. I don't, I don't know how you handle that. Well, I think we've gone pretty far with these issues tonight. If you're all okay with it, I think we're going to uh, close up our session for this evening. And once again, uh, I'm really honored to have three speakers with us tonight. Um, all of you who've talked to us and educated us, informed us, um, testified. I, I really do appreciate what you're doing. And um, I hope we can continue to work together to try to bring this issue out to public support. Uh, Jocko, when they go up to Vermont, by the way, and uh, April 29th, um, we look to help out there if we can in some way. So, yes, sir. Everyone, yep. Um, thank you so much, Jocko, uh, Sandy, and, and Brian, for your, your words and your thoughts tonight. Uh -huh. Let's show you then. Miigwech, Chimiigwech.
The next session will be, as far as we know, April 15th, by the way. Um, and if there's any changes, we'll send out info to all people who have registered as attendees if we add a session or two. Again, Jimmy Gwetch, everyone, Giga Wobbleman. Thank you once again, Gordon. Yep. All right, I'm gonna close down.